Good morning, everyone. Hey, it's so quiet in here. All of a sudden, it went quiet. <laughs> you all okay? Hey, we're going to have a great time this morning. We're good to go there, Trish. Yep. Yep. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Hey, God bless you. Welcome to church this morning. And uh, why don't we open our hearts to God? I'm sure I know that He's got special things to speak into our lives today. Well, let's just stand up and we're going to sing and uh, going to declare the goodness of God and his, how great He is this morning. David's going to lead us. Thanks, Dave. God bless you.
you're here. You're already here. Your presence is already here. Your goodness is already here. It's running after us. There's nowhere we could go. No way we can get away from your goodness, from your presence, from your love, from your love for us.
to be your kids. Why don't you just open your heart to him now? Just run into daddy's arms, our heavenly father, and feel his provision, feel his love, feel his pleasure. He's pleased with you. You're his child.
that you are more than enough. You are Jehovah Jireh, the God who never fails. We bless your name today, Lord God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat for us if you'd like. You know, if you know, if you know me at all, you probably know what I do for a living and I'll just say that I work for the betterment of children is what I do for a living and so when I'm out and about in my society in my grocery store whatever I get sometimes a bit irritated at the lackadaisical um, attitude that some people have towards their kids I was at Kohl's just a couple of days ago and I saw this little girl in the aisle looking at the cards, and I said, I looked around, as I always do, and I, to see how close mom is. It's just a thing that I do, and so I couldn't find anybody around who would claim this child. And I, so I went up to her, trying not to scare people, because I can do that, <laughs> right? So I went up to her and I said, sweetheart, where's your mom, where's your dad? And she goes, she said I could look at the cards, and I said, yeah, but where is she? Uh, she's over there somewhere. And so I went, and I found this mother on the other side of the store in the frozen section. And I guess being who I am, I went up to her and I said, thank you. I went up to her and I said, ma'am, do you know how long it takes for a kid to be kidnapped? For a child to be stolen, it's like 10 seconds, in case you're wondering. In 10 seconds, somebody could have that child and be out of the store, and you'd never know it. And you know, she looked at me like, well, it's none of your business. And all I can think of my, to myself is, if you only knew, if you only knew. You know, there was a time in Jesus' life when he was faced with a similar situation. Now, not necessarily about children, but a time when he said to someone, if you only knew. I don't know if you know the story of the Samaritan woman at the well, but she was there. She was there and Jesus rocked, rocked up and said, can you give me a drink? And she goes, you don't even have a bucket. How are you going to get a drink of water? And he said, and I quote to you, 
in John chapter 4. If you only knew who I am and the gift that God wants to give you, you'd ask me for a drink and I would give you living water. If you only knew. You know, I meet so many people. I see so many people on the street. I bet Haley can probably contest to this. We see so many people on the street and we just want to say, if you only knew how good, how good God is. (laughs) If you only knew how good God is. He would give you a drink and you would never be thirsty again. But you know she, you know what she did? You know what the woman did? She used the butt. She used the butt. And this is the excuse that everybody tries to put on. They say, but what about this? You know what? In Jesus' economy, there's no but. He just says, I love you, and this is what I have for you. There's no but. Just accept it. Just receive it. And that's what he did when he went to the cross. He said, this is what I have for you. Just accept it. It's a gift. It's beautiful. It will change you forever. If you only knew. If you only knew. Go ahead and rip the Band-Aid off of your communion. That's what it sounds like to me. (laughs) Just rip it off. Because here's the deal. And I'll close. The deal is most of us in here do know We do know, but let's be honest, sometimes we live like we don't. Sometimes we live like we don't. And I tell you what, I'm the biggest, I'm guilty. Sometimes I live like I don't. But you know, my God is so amazing because he never turns his back on me. He never says, oh, well, if you're going to act that way, then I'm just going to go over there. No, you know what he does? He just follows me. He follows me until I come to my senses. So today, let's just remember. Let's just know. Let's just know what he does for us. Let's know what he, what he did for us, what he does for us, what he wants to do for us. Let's just know. Can we do that? Let's just pray together and then you take communion. Father God, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. It's the name above all names. It's the name that that came down from heaven, took the form of of, of a child, of a human being, and went to a cross on our behalf. It's that name. That name that I can call in the middle of the night when I'm by myself and I'm feeling distressed and I don't know what to do and my addiction's overtaking me and my, my, my family has left me and I feel abandoned. It's that name. It's that name. And so I bless you today, God. We bless you as a community, as a, as a family. We bless you, God, and we say thank you for loving us so much. Just say it, church. Thank you for loving me, God. Thank you for loving me. And I commit my way to you, God. As I take this communion again today, I'm reminded. I'm reminded of what you did and why you did it. And I'll ever be grateful. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Yeah, when you've just taken the communion, just feel free to pass that along to the end of the row. Someone's going to receive that.
collect it. Mm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah, thanks for sharing, Dallas. Mm. Yeah, the kids could go to Promised Land this morning. I was talking with someone this week who um, knew God in his earlier life and probably not really following that way now of walking with God. And and as I was just praying about it, I felt God just put that word in my heart. You know, I I will never leave you or forsake you. And sometimes when, like Dallas was just saying, you know, when we feel like we want to walk away from God, he never walks away from us. He never leaves us because he promised, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Just a couple of things that are happening I want to mention right now is obviously t- tonight again is our prayer meeting here. And the last one for November. We've been praying every week on a Sunday night uh, during November. And uh, I'd love you to come and join us if you want to. Five, that's five o'clock here at the church. But also, just before that at 4.30, um, we have a, a planning meeting. I want to run through some things that we've got. We're planning for uh, next year. And so uh, it's an opportunity if you want to have some input or you've got some great creative ideas, come along a bit early at 4.30 and we're going to run through some of the things we're planning for next year. And so uh, more than happy if anyone would like to contribute to that, uh, what's happening next year. Because I I believe next year, 23, is going to be a year of real growth for us. I I mean, we're seeing it right now, obviously, but but next year uh, we're going to just uh, burst out. We're going to break out. You know, and I felt God impressed on me some time ago that scripture in Isaiah 54, which says, you know, lengthen your cords like tent pegs. Okay, Link, make the tent pegs bigger, make your tent, make them stronger, make the cords longer, because you're going to break out on the left and the right and you're just going to get bigger than you realize. And I think that's what God wants to do for us. So um, we need to get ready for that, folks, and, and we are. So uh, that's, that's happening. Uh, also, next week, the 4th of December, is our Promised Land presentation uh, that you can see on the screen. They, yeah. <laughs> that'll be good. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, Belinda's been working tirelessly on that, I know, as, as have lots of others as well. So that'll be great. And just the other thing to mention is that um, on the table as you come in, there's a little form there which says, uh, you know, if you'd like to volunteer or if you'd like to do something, because we have got a lot of new people coming here. And if you'd like to be involved in some practical way uh, in some of the things that we do around here, you're more than welcome. Just grab one of those forms and you can tick the boxes if you'd like to tick one of the boxes, what sort of things you can do to uh, help out around here would be great because churches are a volunteer organization, as you know. And so we're all volunteers (laughs) and some of us get paid a little bit, but Basically, we're all volunteers, so you know that. And uh, so uh, there's always a need for more volunteers as, as we go. Um, so there's lots of ways to give uh, for people people contribute financially to the church as well. And uh, just really appreciate that. And, and uh, even to our, our building fund, I was going to mention that uh, you, you know that we've, uh, we have successfully uh, bought the building here. And uh, as of... In the next week, we, we, we're going to make our first mortgage payment as opposed to rent. We've been paying rent for the last year. And now we're going to start paying a mortgage uh, instead of the rent. That's pretty awesome. Um, so, and people have been con- continuing to give towards this. So uh, just in case anyone more else would like to give towards that, you can do that. Also on the table, there's some little slips, which have got the numbers, the bank numbers for that. A new home fund, if you'd like to contribute towards that. God bless you. Now, we're going to be really blessed this morning to have an amazing man of God come and preach to us and just explain some things in the Word of God. And uh, uh, he's been here, he's been preaching before here, but he's been preaching for a long time in other places. And uh, he's got a great revelation of God. Why don't we put our hands together and welcome Murray as he comes right now to share the Word of God with us today. What's your Murray?
Are we going? Oh, we're on. <laughs> Got to turn it on. Uh, well, it's good to be back. Been away for a while, been over in Western Australia, and um, it's good to get all that work behind me, get out of the way. Um, one of the things that, when I start preparing a sermon, first thing that comes to mind, I say to God, I'm not worthy to deliver this message. And he comes back and he says, that's right, you're not. <laughs> and he says, but I am, so you are. So that's what we're going on this morning. I just want to start, just read from you, to you from Romans. In verse nine, uh, chapter 8 and verse 19, it says, The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. Why is the creation waiting eagerly for the sons of God to be revealed? You know, I see creation is, is but just a little bit of its former glory. Because creation, ever since the fall of man, has been in decay. I've suffered a bit from that a little bit, not much. But, you know, it was, it was much more beautiful. It was, and, and yet, it's deteriorating. You know, and in verse um, 20, it says, For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. You see, even creation is waiting for Jesus to come. Creation wants to be restored. Creation is part of the future kingdom of God. It's not just us. He's restoring his creation, all, all that he did. And in verse 22, it says, We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in pains of childbirth, right up until this present time. Waiting, anticipating what's going to happen. You know, I believe in, in recent years, there has been a, a great deterioration in creation. But not only that, there is even a greater deterioration in the, um, the moral fibre that we're seeing in our society. We're seeing that, you know, like you talk about climate change, I tell you about the, the change in attitude of this world and in the attitude of people and the moral fibre is in decline. The godly values that have been lost. Now, instead of looking back to God and saying, well, what, what does your word say? You know, you, you are eternal. You are, you know, your word covers the whole spectrum. Yet now we're subject to public opinion and good thoughts about how we should go ahead and how we should move forward. You know, the truth has been blurred, tremendously blurred. You know, it's... Um, I just think that there's just so much information out there and we don't know which is, which is right, which is correct, what should I follow? Should it be just these thoughts that I have? Should it be some popular person's opinion? What, what should I follow? And we've got information overload and I, and I have seen that, you know, I think back to the time of um, the Iraqi war. You know, for the first time I remember that there was this on TV, on a news report, just a camera in the nose of a missile and they were directing it into a bunker, into a hole and it followed it all the way in as it was happening. What has happened to our world? There were people in that bunker that were vaporised at that very moment. You know? And we are so desensitised in our society that that's just popular TV. What has happened to our world? That, that what has changed? Life is, is all of a sudden devalued. You know, what, what is the correct way? We have a, a crippled society in so many ways. We have social media that can, just with words, 
bring people to tears, that can bring people down just because we're so detached from people's feelings and our communication and, and, and seeing how they're feeling and what, the, what you're sensing, that we can just say words and it'll bring people down and destroy them. I remember a, a news report, one, one popular person got on a plane who put one comment when she left England on her social media. She was a popular person. When she got to South Africa, her whole life was destroyed. Her whole, um, I guess, her, her persona had been destroyed. In that time she was flying, the whole world was talking about her comment and her attitude and, and it brought her down. And she was devastated. You know, in 8.23, it says, Not only so, but we ourselves... Who have, who have the first fruits of the Spirit. So we're the beginning of the new thing that God's going to do. Grown inwardly as we eagerly wait for our adoption as sons and the redemption of our bodies. You know, that's, that's a, that groaning that we have, but um, is it any wonder that in Ephesians it says, we, we contend not against flesh and blood, that's not your real problem. But we contend against principalities and powers and, and rulers and, and things going on in the heavenly realms. Things that we can't really touch. You know, it's good in some ways that I can't really see into the heavenlies because I'd probably be scared what's going on there. There's so many powers that says, I want to bring you down. I want to destroy what God's message is. I want to destroy what, what God is saying to you. I want, to, I want to pull you away from those things. I want to give you a lie to follow than follow in what God wants you to do and what he wants to achieve in your life. Because these forces, they do not like God and what he's doing. It's their last ditched effort before God pulls it all together through Jesus in his second coming. And he's... And it's his last, and they, they're rising up right now. And there's a massive amount of activity in this world right now. We look at the, the wars that were going over there and what Russia's, what's happening with Russia and, and what, what's happening with other countries. There is this tension that's going on and devaluation of life. You know, is it any wonder, you know, as I travel around and I work with various CEOs and and tradies and all sorts of things. And, you know, I can be there in the, in the middle of the night and we're working together and I haven't met this person before. And, uh, and we get talking and I see that he'd had some sort of Christian um, background as we're talking. And he said, you know, after a little while we're talking, he said, you know, I don't know what I believe anymore. You know, he said, I'm struggling. You know, I really feel because he said, you know, like science has got this great argument against God. I said, no, they haven't. You know, um, but he is struggling. There was another customer I was standing on, standing on his balcony one morning. He's not a Christian guy. We were standing there together in the early morning. I'm about to go off and do some other work and he's doing his stuff. And all of a sudden he says to me, what's it all about? What am I doing here? Why have I worked so hard? What's it about? You know, and if it finishes at the grave, then yes, what's it all about? If it finishes at the coffin, what's it all about? Is it just that... And he, he was very much interested in climate change and, and, and making the world a better place to live and that. That's not really the answer that we're needing right now. And all he could think of is... Maybe I'm doing something for my kids, at least they'll have a better life while on earth. You know, that was the fulfilment of his whole purpose. And your heart goes out um, to these guys. Mm. You know, I remember years ago as I was driving my old Vauxhall Velox around Toowoomba. You probably wouldn't even know what that is. But <laughs> Toowoomba's noted for its fogs, you know, and so I was travelling up. Uh, up the range there, really deep fogs up there. 
I'm doing about 10 miles an hour. I've got my head out the window at night and I'm trying to see the edge of the road and all I've got is about three or four cat's eyes, maybe two cat's eyes, in front of me and I'm following them. And I thought I knew where I was going <laughs> and by direction. And I couldn't believe it, but eventually I actually turned down the old toll bar road, which is a dead end. <laughs> and it's not real pretty down there, I tell you, not in the deep fog. But I got lost. I thought I knew where I was going. I thought I, thought I had it all worked out and I had a, an, a, an exit plan. And I got it wrong. And, you know, it's... Um, You know, it, it shows us something. And I, I brought something along with me this morning. And uh, I made this oh, 25, 30 years ago. Do you know that um, everything is really subject to gravity, isn't it? You know, even I am. <laughs> Things are falling. Um, <laughs> but... I made this thing about 25, 30 years ago, and it defies gravity. And, uh, and it hasn't sagged in all that time. Amazing, you know? So, and, and this is it here. I'll just pull it out. Here it is. Look at that. It defies gravity. See? <laughs> See? It just stays up there all the time. Isn't that amazing? You know? And it, it's in a relationship with this here. And, and, and there's... There's something going on. There's a relationship between these two items. You know, if God could do that in his creation, in the natural, how complicated is it for his spirit to talk to us, even with, you know, things between? I can put something between that. makes no difference to it. It just works straight through it. I could put, oh, you know, I think I even bought one here, yeah. I could put this dark fog around there, see? Can't see it? Yet it's still in relationship to it. That's like the Spirit of God. He, no matter what dark cloud that you might have in your life, no matter what you might be going through. You know, I, I see some of these days when I'm travelling off and, 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 it's, and it's foggy or it's, or it's got deep clouds and you can't see the sun. Get in that jet, get up to 30,000 feet, you know what, the sun is always shining. It's always there above that cloud. You might think you've got clouds in your life. You might think you're detached from God. You might think that he can't communicate with you, but he's forever in that relationship with you. He knows where you are. He knows what you think. He wants to have that, that, re, uh, that um, communication with you. He wants to know that worship that you might have with him. <clears throat> you know, Moses, when he was looking after the sheep for his father-in-law, was wandering around there. Next thing he sees this um, bush on fire. This is no ordinary bush. It's on fire, but it's not getting consumed. And he hears this voice, and God said, Come a bit closer. Um, take your shoes off. You're on holy ground. Here's this communication between the Almighty God to a man on earth. And he says, and, he, and he, he talks to Moses and he said, you know, I've got a message. But it has, really it has two outcomes. One message, but two outcomes. One message was, to the people of Israel who have been in slavery for 400 years in Egypt with all the hardship, God says, I have not forgotten you. I am concerned about you. I'll just open up in Exodus. And he says there, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them. 
That was his message to them. But Moses was a little bit concerned. He thought, well, I've got to take this message, first of all, back to the people of Israel who've been in slavery for 400 years, and they might not believe me. They might think, no, in all that time, God has forgotten it. Why? Why now? Why would he want to do something in my life? And he said to them, I want you to say to them, the I am has sent me, sent me to you. I am was the personal name of God. You see, it is the same God. I am the God who created you. I am the God who looked after your fathers in the wilderness. I am the one who did those miracles. There is no one else you can look to that you can compare me to because I am the great I am. And he went back to, those, to, the, to the people there and they, and they believed it and they got a result. And so that was one outcome of that message. The other mess, part of the message was the same message that went to the king of Egypt and said, let my son Israel. See, it was personal to God. It wasn't just a group of people, not just a nation. He saw them as, my, saw this, this nation as his son, his, his firstborn son. He says, let, let my son go that he may worship me. Let him go out into the wilderness and let him worship me. And the other part of the message is that the king said, no, I'm, I'm better than that. I'm not going to listen to the great I am. That was his worst mistake. You don't say that to God Almighty. You don't ignore him. He is all-powerful. He is mighty. And do you know that that nation walked out that day and when they, when they went, they went door to door and people gave them gold and silver and all sorts of things to send them on their way. But that, that nation, because they went against God, that nation lost cattle, they lost people, they lost an army. Not only that, they lost their firstborn. They took God that far and he stepped in and he says, no way. I love my people. I love my firstborn. I love them. And nothing's going to stand in the way of getting them to me to worship me. Quite powerful, isn't it? Nothing is in the way. Don't mess with my son. Mm. And while you're waiting, waiting for your adoption to come, you know, he talks about us as receiving the first fruits. We are already on the way. We are adopted firstborn sons of God. And he says, nothing in this world is going to stop me or get in the way of having them with me and worship, worshipping me and restoring my creation and bringing it back together. Nothing is going to stand in the way of it. And I believe at the moment that there are things stirring up in this world that's saying you're not going to have them. You can't have them. They can't be yours. And God's saying, I am the great I am. Nothing is going to stand in my way. And it's, you're going to suffer pain. This world is going to suffer pain. If, and all these authorities and, and these things in high places are going to suffer because they won't give us up. And it's going to come to something where God is going to have to do something drastic to get his firstborn, to get his first fruits with him. So there's stuff going on that we're going to see, we're part of right now. You think it's, it, it's, it's tough in life, and it is. But there's a lot of tension in the world right now. 
You know, it's... But in all that, you think, well, how can I sort all this out? How can I, how can I work out what I should do and where I should go and what I should do? It, and I, and I, I think about those sort of things and I thought, you know, it doesn't have to be that complicated. It can be quite simple. And while it's in WA, I often, if I can get a chance, I like to go to Teen Challenge, which is quite a bit way out of town, and um, out to the farm. And they have a chapel there, and I like to go and have church there with them. And twice now, <laughs> they didn't put it on social media, but um, they went somewhere else that day. So <laughs> I drove all that way out there, and there was nobody. So the last time I was there, I just sat in the chapel on my own and looked at all the things around there, and, and then they went. I had a bit of quiet time. This time I went out, and I, and I saw that there was nobody in sight. So I'm sitting there in the car, thinking, OK, well, I do now. I could go back to work. Um, <laughs> um, but I saw a sign over in the gum trees, out on its own, big letters carved into wood. And I thought, yes, it is so simple. Because it said, and it comes from John chapter 14, it says, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I thought, God, it's so simple. I got my whole, a whole time with you this morning at that moment. Jesus. You, don't, you know, when, when we're talking about I am the way, I think about, you know, you go to these parks, and these national parks, or you go into a shopping centre and you see this map up on the wall and it says, and you, and you look at this map and, and you see, oh, you are here. Oh, good, OK, that's where I am. Now, where do I want to go? I want to go up onto that lookout up there in the park and everything like that. So you've got to go across that river and everything like that and, and around here and finally get up to there. And it's quite a complicated thing and you get halfway and you think, now, which way was that again? You know, and sometimes in life we're saying, how can I please God? How can I be morally good enough that God would notice me and want me? And Jesus said, I am the way. It is all done. It's all in me. It's all complete. You need to accept me. I am the way. And, you know, I think of, you know, baptism is such a, a good example of that because... You know, I, I think and there's many ways you can look at baptism. But one of the things is, is if you go under that water and you're there for three or four minutes, the breath that God gave you a creation is gone. Okay? This, you, you're not going to live, are you? Yet this nail-pierced hand reaches down and pulls you up and says, you're not going to die. I'm going to, I have rescued you. I have pulled you out of that. If you stay in this world and if you don't have God, you're going to run out of the breath that he has put in you and you've got no place to go. You think it's over when you might die, but no, there's more. But if you know God, then the other part of the message is for you, that hope, that joy, that being with him in worship. He, he reaches down and he finds you. And I, and I think... That sometimes we get caught up on trying to go along that moral journey to show God that, you know, I'm good enough. I'm good enough. Hmm. And then he says that I am the way and I am the truth. And truth is so important. We've got to know where we're going. Because if you know the truth, you can get rid of a lot of lies out of your life. You can get a lot of tension out of your life. You can be happy in your own skin. Because if you know the truth that God loves you and won't let you go, and he appreciates you, and you, when you got saved, you didn't have to do anything. You didn't have to prove to him how good you were. You didn't have to go through that moral decline in, in, in your life and, and then say, well, look, I've got to fix this up and then, God, you'll accept me. No. He says, I take you now. Because of Jesus, I love you 
I want you. You are part of my plan. You are part of my kingdom. I want you with me. Because I know what I, my spirit in you will do for you. And that truth, you know, and, and I think about that, you know, if we went on a bus trip into the wilderness of, uh, of Australia and we get on there in the afternoon and, and we go to sleep on the bus and somewhere during the night the bus breaks down and we wake up and you say, where the heck am I? Where am I? You know, and you, and you might say, well, then all these people start have these good ideas. Well, it says, I have this guru and he says, you know, if you ever get lost, just, um, just walk towards where the sun rises, all right? And you'll be okay. Other people say, well, um, I have this thought. I have this great thought. Uh, we'll go this way. Okay. And, then, and then you have the others say, no, I think I'll just wait here and I'll get rescued. You know? And yet and then there's somebody pops up and says, look, hang on. I live from around here. I'm only 20 k's up the road. You know, I live at this town. And if you walk this way, you will be rescued. You will find food. You will find shelter. You will not die. And it's like Jesus turns up and he says, I am the truth. If you walk this way, then you will come into my kingdom. Then you will meet with my Father. And we will worship together. And I have this, this, this great plan for your eternal life with me. And then he says, I am the life. What a life. The Father says, when you come to Jesus, my spirit comes into your spirit. And if you're willing, if you're willing to open up to his spirit, if you're willing to allow his spirit to come and teach you, because that's what it talks about in, in the scriptures. He is the teacher. Allow his spirit to teach our spirit about who God is. And who is God? He is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. They're the characteristics of God's spirit. That's who he is. That, that's what he is like. And he wants you to be like him because he knows it works, because he created you. He knows who you should be. And that you are not worthless. And when he brings that, that life into you, he takes away those fears. I am the life, it's an abundant life. Mm. No longer condemned and comfortable in your own skin. This morning, maybe the musos would like to come right now. Mm. There's been a couple of things that, as I was preparing this, I, that God spoke to me about. And I don't know whether it is someone here this morning or somebody who's looking online. But one of the things, and I, and I brought, and I actually went and bought something during the week, to um, to help. It's just a practical thing. But I feel that there's someone here this morning, or online, that is constantly measuring themselves. And I went and bought a, a ruler. <laughs> this week and, and it's like you're looking down and you're constantly looking and say well I failed and you're looking at it millimetre by millimetre and there's this short circuit in your life where it's between you and the ruler and say so, I failed again I failed again I tried so hard but I failed again you know but God wants you to not look at the ruler. He wants you to look at, to him. And he says, I saved you. My spirit is in you. I love you. I've placed a new perspective in you, a new purpose, a new place that you're going to. Yes, it's a little bit bumpy along the way, but I am taking you this way. And I, what I've done, this, what I'm going to do this morning, I'm going to leave that ruler there. And if you want to, you can come and you can break that ruler in half. 
as a symbol of what's going on in your life. And just in case there were two people, <laughs> I, I brought another ruler. But feel free to break them. I'm really happy. If I hear a snapping noise this morning, I'd be really excited. Maybe you'd like to just all stand right now. But he also said to me, there's somebody else here this morning that says, um, the world is pressing in on me. And I just want to be in a cradle. And God, I just want to be rocked by you. I just, I'd like, things are really difficult, really hard, and I just want to, um, I just want to be rocked. You can start playing if you like, yeah. And I just want to, I just want to be rocked by you. I just want the comfort that comes from God. I want to know the Spirit of God just to come into my life and to massage me and to heal me. There's so many things that, that I've got there. And, and there's somebody else that says um, that, that I heard it. <laughs> Hallelujah. There's still another one. <laughs> I still have another one. Thank you. <laughs> Isn't that good? But, um, hmm. I just want to, I just want to, I just want to share something with you right now. Just a, a part of a verse. It's still in Romans, and it's to do with that, that comfort, that, that tension that you're feeling. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express, and He searches. He, and he who searches a heart knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. There are times when you cannot express with your words what you're feeling. It might be for yourself, it might be for people that you're praying for, and you just can't. And I've had those moments back in my life somewhere where I had a friend and they were going through some stuff and I, I didn't want cliches. I just wanted something real. I just wanted to say something and I couldn't. And I groaned. And you know, I felt like the Spirit knew what I was groaning about. He knew what I was feeling. Because there's this interaction between God through His Spirit. And He knows what's going on with us. And, he's, and he's, He knows the things that we need when we don't know ourselves. That's who He is. And then there is just one other thing where it says, I feel my mind won't rest. And I just want God to give me that deep rest. Shutting out the concerns, I can't do it on my own. I tell you, God has not forgotten you. He is deeply aware of you and what you're feeling and what you're going through. And he wants to do something in your life. And he, and he just wants you to step up and say, God, here I am, here's my hand. You know, there's be a lot of groaning if you like, but God, I need you right now. There's a lot of stuff going on. And I just want to encourage you this morning just to come and as we, as we sing at the, with the musos in a minute, just to come and stand here and say, God, rock me. That might be rock you gently, it might be rock you violently, I don't know. <laughs> but rock me, because I need something. I need your spirit to step in this morning. I, need, I can't do it on my own anymore. So you come. I, and, and if you're watching online, just sing out to God right now. Or find somebody who can understand what you're going through and share that with them. And, and to be prayed for. Um, and His Spirit, it doesn't matter, His Spirit is more than capable of coming in and changing things in your life. Thank you. Thank you. I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me. And all my days I've been held in your hands from the 
the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God